I've been looking at different ways to explain our current political and social climate. All of the modern woes from single motherhood to a destruction of general social norms have always appeared to me, and I would assume to the public as well, as separate issues. But recently, I have read an experiment called Death Spiral, The Explosive Growth and Demise of a Mouse Population by John Calhoun. I believe this experiment can tightly summarize our modern plague. My question is, what do you think about this experiment and how can we change our behavior in order to get a better conclusion than the rats? That's from Sam. Wait, rats or mice? What are we talking here? Uh, I think the experiment is mice. It's the mouse utopia good. stuff, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so you've read it recently, right? Uh, I actually have it up right here. I've done a presentation on it, so... Okay, don't, don't read it. it, but if oh, you course. can just give yeah. me the gist, or give the audience the gist. I've done a show on this a while back ago, but uh, since it's fresher in yeah. your mind, uh, you can go for it. In this, our second brief analysis of the world's greatest philosopher since Socrates, Stefan Molyneux, we'll examine his recent video titled, Will Civilization Collapse? in which the caller brings up the Mouse Utopia experiment conducted in 1968 by the ethologist John Calhoun. Molyneux, no stranger to promulgating doom porn, has, of course, already done an entire show on this same experiment, in which he postured himself quite well versed on the subject matter. Here, however, he seems to have forgotten what it was about, and lets the caller refresh his, or rather the audience's, memory. So basically, John Calhoun, there was worries about overpopulation in the 1960s. You know, there was going to be enough food and enough water. So he decided... Strangely enough, I'm sorry I... to interrupt you just when you start. Yeah. There was great fears about overpopulation in the 1960s. So what they did was they sent approximately a trillion dollars a day to the third world, because that's really going to help <laughs> them solve the overpopulation problem. Anyway, go yes. on. Yeah, no, you see the ex exponential growth of population. They were afraid they were going to run out of food and water. But Calhoun decided to do the experiment where there was unlimited food, unlimited water, and he wanted to see what would happen. You know, would there just be like a pile of mice, just a million of them in a sphere that would pile up in the cage? So he took away, you know, predators, weather, the food, and, you know, lack of water and re uh, general resources. And basically what happened is after there's an initial explosion of population, then slower growing of population, and then the population just sunk off. And what is really interesting is what happened when that population sunk off. Notice that there's no discussion whatever about to what degree, if any, mice can act as a valid model for human society. It's simply accepted at face value that the experiment accurately describes what will happen. Go on. So, oh, well... First off, when the mice gathered up in the cage, basically there was a couple of quadrants and the cage was four stories high. And the report itself is kind of cryptic in that it describes these as apartments just to kind of draw the analogy. And if you look at the distribution on the graph of where the mice create their nests, even with the equal distribution of resources across the entire cage, the mice centralized in certain places. They kind so of went even, urban. Yes, just, just by itself. You know, even with equal population, you know, there would be less competition in that area for resources. The mice still went there. And one of the more interesting things that happened in the experiment was that slowly and slowly, the female mice became to become infertile, just naturally. They couldn't, there wasn't any disease going around. There wasn't any, you know, mauling going around. They just weren't fertile. Their litters became less and less, you know, usually mice will have like litters of 17, I'm not sure what the term for baby mouse is, but 17 baby mice. And slowly that became, you know, most mothers would only have like one mouse per litter, which you can't really keep up the population doing that. Like me, my wife, and Ann Coulter. Yep, got it. Yes. Molyneux's interjection here, affirming that he too has only produced one child, is strange to say the least. Given that, as he has said in the past, he laments that white people will be replaced by the migrant hordes because of their failure to not reproduce in large numbers. Anyway, but with the beautiful ones, 
And what happened was this population, instead of gauging socially with the rest of the mice, they kept it themselves and they simply just constantly groomed themselves. And that's why they were beautiful. You know, they're just constantly grooming themselves and that's how they occupied themselves. Uh, this group of mice also developed homosexual behaviors, which is kind of like in, in proportionate numbers. To it's a what form would, of collective population control because then you have, of course, the mice having sex without babies coming out. So, And how does Molyneux know that because some of the mice engaged in homosexual behavior, this was a form of population control and not simply aberrant behavior because of the artificial conditions of the experiment? Yes. But sorry, go on. Yes. So then eventually, because between the infertile female mice and the homosexual male mice, the population of the cages spiraled out of control. And wait, wait, they wait, originally wait, hang started... on. What do you mean? So the population spiraled out of control sounds like there was a population explosion. But if we have the homosexual mice, the uh, basically relatively infertile female mice and so on, then you get a population decline, right? Yeah, like down, spiral down. Oh, so the population right, going out of control means that the, the bottom fell out of it like Western European yes. white style. Okay, got it. Yes, and that, that's why I think this study is so fascinating because it explains exactly, in my mind, what is happening today. So basically after, what is it? Roughly, they estimated after 1,200 days, every single mouse would, every single mouse would be dead. The, uh, the initial 12 settlers. <laughs> okay, well, that's that's a rather startling thing to drop in on people unexpectedly. Yeah, but I know. Okay. Death yeah. will go. Yeah. Okay. The result of the experiment was death, and Molyneux hammers this point home emphatically. As by definition, the same fate awaits the little white mice listening to our great philosopher. And what the ter why he titled it Death Squared is that he noticed there was the initial death of the mice, which was their social activities with each other. And this death, this first death of the social norms between the mice, led to the second death of the physical death of the mice and the population. Now, do they have an explanation as to why, when the population began to spiral down, and again, this is all in a situation where they have no predators and more than enough to eat and drink, right? Yes, there's no predators, there's unlimited food, unlimited water. So well, no migrants, got it. Um, yeah, no, no, no. Molyneux seems committed to the anthropomorphic fallacy, as it would be absurd to assume that mice have any conception of migrants at all, much less one analogous to our own. But here it becomes clear that it's not quite the result of his own ignorance, but more because he's attempting to present the experiment as an exact replica of human society outside population to control and make it look like the population's going up you know yeah, so do they have an explanation as to why in order to sustain the group the fertility did not begin to increase when it began to freefall um there was some minor experimentation on that in that one of his colleagues took the beautiful ones they took these mice and put them in a separate cage you know like those additional settlers and they never regained back that behavior at all. You mean the rutting with lots of kids behavior? Yeah. Right. They never regained that, you know, make greater populations behavior. They turned it off and they couldn't turn it back on. Wait, and now is that in a situation where they still have more than enough food and drink and no predators? Or did they put them back into a situation of scarcity and predation again? Uh, they put them back into, you know, a similar, you know, you know, Fertile females, you know, the same unfamiliar food and unlimited water. Right, right, right. Okay. Basically. Okay. It wasn't it. out back into the wild completely. Which is an insanely artificial environment for all living species, right? Per his own words, that would include humans as well, as humans would be included in all living species. But this raises the question of our own natural environment. If, in the context of the Mouse Utopia experiment, we are able to have population explosions and have no predators, does that not make what we call civilization an artificial environment? In which case, a collapse would have nothing to do with migrants, welfare, or low fertility. Those would be incidental. And everything to do with aberrant behavior as a result of an artificial environment.
right? I mean, because normally when you have an explosion of population, you either, either run out of food or they draw in predators and then they feed the predators who then explode in population. So there's that balance that, that comes out. Yes. So this idea that you would end up with this population explosion with no counteraction uh, is a pretty wild scenario that evolution would never have figured things out for. Now, like you said, like this is a very artificial situation that these mice have been put into. Yeah, and, I mean, ex except that it's the welfare yeah. state, but go on. <laughs> basically, and that's, that's where I find it myself, is this is basically a giant analogy to our modern climate, you know, like it's not an West, analogy; it's a modeling. Good point. Yeah, yeah. I think because well, an analogy well, yeah. would be a, a sort of metaphorical comparison, but it's a recreation. Yes. And let's see. What was what was I about to say? You're saying it was a very artificial situation. Oh yeah. And I was pointing and, out the welfare state thing, but go on. You know, I find the parameters for this experiment to be kind of similar to our modern society you know what i mean like you don't have massive fears of food shortages in, at least in the west you know you don't have nobody starves to shortages. death in the west unless yeah, you're basically. really crazy like unless you're really out there mentally yeah it's almost i mean it's impossible to starve to death in the west and you know there's no general predation you know there you know if you look at European wars, you know, this is the most peaceful time in Europe possible. Well, besides the political wars, but, you know, as far as physical fighting wars, this is the most peaceful time in the West. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, for me, at least, it's pretty wild. And I think about this every couple of weeks, probably, which is that certainly over the last 100, 120 years, to be born when I was born and to get to the age of 51, having never been drafted is pretty remarkable. Remarkable in that Molyneux was born after both world wars and has lived in Canada for most of his life, a relatively peaceful country that hasn't held a draft since World War II. Absolutely. So the question is, what do you do in Western society to prevent this first and second death? And that gets... Oh yeah, really no, that's, that to me is easy. Yeah, that, yeah. The answer is freedom. Freedom, a vague amorphous term here that could mean anything, and is really a non-answer. What kind of freedom is Molyneux referring to? Physical? Political? Religious? And if the experiment is a direct model of human society, what does freedom mean in that context, and how does it apply? The answer freedom, is freedom. Right. Yeah, the answer freedom. is freedom. L let me sort of give you an example that's going to get most people's jimmies in a twist. So, right. you know, whenever I do videos where women appear to be doing foolish things, the four by four one I put that, that was out recently, people are like, repeal the 19th, gotta not let women vote. And it's like, no, that's not the problem. The problem is not that women vote. The problem is that there's so much to vote on. The inference is the same for both propositions. For if women should not vote, then it is implicitly stated that they lack the ability to know how to do so rightly. And to say that there is just too much to vote on says the same thing, only in a different way. The problem is not that women or men or the poor or smart or dumb people vote. The problem is that voting controls trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. That's the problem. I th yeah, I think like, you know, voting is an enabler to predate your neighbor. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. when you can vote to take away other people's property, it kind of doesn't matter whether men or women or whoever vote. Molyneux quickly generalizes the problem to include everyone now, framing it as the act of voting itself being the problem, as it enables you to prey on your neighbor and to take their property. The inference being that everyone is either greedy, stupid, evil, or a combination of all three. And, you know, people also say, ah, the problem is we don't have an ethnostate. And it's like, hey, you know who, you know who had ethnostates? Europeans in 1914, right before World War One. Hey, you know who else had ethnostates to a large degree? Europeans in 1939, right before World War Two. I don't think ethnostates is the magical answer to avoid problems that you're thinking of. 
Molyneux commits the reductio ad absurdum fallacy here, equating any ethnostate to causing world wars. If this is the cause, we may ask why any other ethnically homogeneous state, such as China or some African or Nordic country, has not yet attempted a world coup. So that is just the basic, what we need is not blacks or whites or ethnostates or, or, or nationalism of this, what we need is freedom. So if we say, well, women prefer, uh, I'm not going to try and argue the truth of all of these statements. These are just ideas that are out there and I'm just going to provide solutions that involve freedom. So please don't uh, think that everything I say oh, here is stuff I believe. I'm not right? gonna this is one rather stunning moment where without needing to show how his reasoning, such as it is, is flawed, or what fallacy he has committed, Molyneux reveals himself as a sophist in crystal clear language that should have given even his most loyal fans pause because of the sheer incoherence of his statement. He sets up the next propositions by saying that he won't attempt to argue for the truth of them but just wants to provide solutions for them based on freedom. If Molyneux was talking about some fictional universe he's creating for a new book, there would be no problem with that statement, but he's not. These statements are meant to reflect some facet of the world, and therefore must necessarily be true or false. But if Molyneux wants to offer solutions for them, then they must be true as a false statement can have no solution other than pointing out how it is false. Molyneux craftily avoids all this by saying that he doesn't really believe in all this stuff, and it's just out there, leading one to ask why would you provide solutions to something that you don't believe in the first place? Fact check you right yeah, now. Yeah. Oh, no, this yeah. is not all stuff I believe. This is just arguments out there. So people say, well, women, pre women prefer security to freedom. And therefore, if women vote, they'll vote in big giant welfare states, and then your freedom gets destroyed. It's like, okay, there's arguments that say that female suffrage added significant proportions to the growth of the state. But okay, let's just say that that's a true argument to one degree or another. What is the solution? Bar women from voting? No, no. The solution you see, given that women prefer security to freedom, is to not have the power to redistribute income through the state. So we are to take this as something that's just out there floating about, and not something that Molyneux himself asserts, which stretches credulity. In any case, what would make women desire security more than men? And what does he mean by security? Doesn't the very concept of civilization arise from a very basic need for security against hostile nature, in order that concepts like freedom can be given any meaning at all? Because then women who desire security over freedom will find that security by marrying great men who are responsible and good providers. Yay! Male virtue gets a big thumbs up and a tingly nether bit from the female of the species. So there's a freedom. People say, oh, well, you know, women aren't that interested in politics and you know, the, the I average IQ for women is lower and blah, blah. Okay, well, the free market could handle that because to have resources in the free market is to have some influence on society. And so if you believe that women aren't as competent as men, then the free market will deal with that because women will end up in aggregate having fewer resources with which to influence society. And again, I'm not saying I believe all this stuff. I'm just saying here's how things play out as a whole. In other words, women are really too dumb to do much of anything, it seems. The inference is that this doesn't become clear because the artificial environment the state has made props up the least capable, i.e. women. And only by returning to that magical, natural world known as the free market will this aberration be made right again. Again, how the free market would be any less artificial than the state, if we are taking the mice as a direct model, is unknown. But Molyneux again states that he doesn't believe all this stuff, but that's how it all plays out, just in case we forgot. Now, I think part of the problem with the predation of voting is that most people that vote don't realize it is a predation. You know, they don't see, you know, increasing taxes as a use of force at all. I mean, they're like, oh yeah, it's just taxes, whatever, price we pay for society, blah, 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 blah. 
So I think that's also uh, part of the problem. No. <laughs> no? No. These moments in the Colin shows are always very comical. The caller makes his assertion that voting is predatory, and Molyneux simply says no, without parsing any of it out to see why it isn't the case, and just makes his own preformed assertion, to which the caller quickly acquiesces and leaves his own assertion forgotten and undefended. I mean, I don't think so. Let me tell you why. So let's just sort of look at it from an evolutionary standpoint. The woman, right. women who cared about the moral source of the, of the income with which they fed their children, the women who cared about that more, would they do better or worse than the women who didn't care about the source of the income and just used whatever necessary to feed their kids? The women who cared more would be more successful. No, the women who cared no. less would be more successful because the women who cared more would say, well, I don't want that money because it come from potentially illicit sources. At what point in evolution is he referring to? He never says, only stating broadly, let's look at this evolutionarily, in which case we can go back to before there was any civilization at all. And this raises the question, why would any moral sentiment, as we now understand it, enter into the ability to survive in nature? But since the implication is that women, even in the first periods of human existence would have made moral judgments about where their resources came from or how they were acquired, and that not caring where or how they were gotten would have ensured a higher chance of survivability and care for her children, the inference is that even today women are largely amoral. So they would care as much if their resources came from a man that worked for the mafia killing people as if he were a college professor. As the video goes on, it gets farther and farther away from the actual mouse experiment and more towards the problems as Molyneux sees them of society. So we'll end our short analyses here. Thank you for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment.